Our next presenter is William Carroll. Bill Carroll is a critical sociologist whose scholarship has illuminated structures of inequity and movements for change. His award-winning books and articles have mapped the elite networks through which large corporations and their owners and executives wield power, while also exploring how movements for social justice and ecological well-being organize efforts at reform and socio-political transformation. His issues-oriented music videos have brought these concerns to the general public and activist communities. Corporations wield enormous power, but how does corporate power work? Corporate capitalism is a market-mediated system of concentrated class power. Those who own and control large corporations form a corporate elite, even as they compete for shares of the economic surplus. The elite is the top tier of the capitalist class. It wields economic, political, and cultural power and influence. But how is that power socially organized? In the history of corporate capitalism, we can see an increasing concentration and centralization of capital, a deepening symbiosis between finance and industry, and growing transnationalization of capital, enhancing its structural power. In recent decades, the organized capitalism of the post-war boom gave way to the disorganized capitalism of neoliberal times. For the corporate elite, this coincided with a shift from a culture of leisure and private clubs to a culture of business activism. To explore the social organization of corporate power, I've mapped corporate networks in Canada and internationally from the post-war era to present times. In the post-war era, a stable core of interlocking directorates lent cohesion to the corporate elite. For instance, the Bank of Montreal and the CPR averaged seven shared directors each year. Subsequently, the interlock network thinned and private clubs became less important vehicles of elite cohesion. New corporate sponsored think tanks and business councils emerged as the elite became the leading voice for neoliberal governance. As the 20th century closed out, the core of Canada's corporate elite network became more transnationalized. The most central firms were mostly Canada-based transnational corporations. My research on the elite network of the world's largest corporations revealed a shift towards transnational interlocking in the early 21st century, with Canadian firms linked mainly to European and American companies. These studies show how corporate power works through several specific modalities. Its economic face is coterminous with the entire process of capital accumulation, but corporate power also reaches into civil and political society through hegemonic practices that organize consent to business as usual, through corporate sponsored think tanks, corporate media, lobbying, and so on. Since 2015, I've been co-directing a team of 100 researchers and community advisors at the Corporate Mapping Project, focusing on Canada's co fossil capital sector. In a context requiring urgent climate action, we find corporate capital at the center of a regime of obstruction. The regime is constituted through modalities of power that protect fossil capital revenue streams while bolstering popular support for additional investment. It incorporates a panoply of networked practices at different scales, again, reaching into civil and political society and into indigenous communities. Network analytic findings from our project make this clear. Our mapping of share ownership of fossil capital corporations reveals a confluence of concentrated ownership by wealthy families, transnational parent corporations and financial institutions like the RBC. As for the elite network, directors of fossil fuel firms, most of them Calgary-based, sit extensively on each other's boards, forming the cohesive core of Calgary's business community. This core, in turn, is part of a regionalized national network, as fossil companies share directors with financial institutions based mainly in Toronto and with other major Canadian corporations in Canada's main cities. Interlocking governance boards carry the influence of fossil companies into institutions of civil society, such as think tanks, universities, 
business councils, and industry groups in a pattern of elite cohesion paired with exclusion of voices from other social sectors. The fossil fuel sector maintains a dense lobbying network as industry representatives meet with public officials on average six times per working day, far outpacing the entire environmental NGO sector. Traces of corporate power are evident in the network through which philanthropic foundations steer financial resources mainly to clean growth and conservationist environmental initiatives compatible with industry interests, shaping the contours of ecological politics. Our network mappings provide a window on the social organization of corporate power. Corporate power is seated in economic relations that afford a tiny organized minority control over the economic present and future. But this power reaches into civil and political society, shoring up the conditions for continued dominance. However, corporate power can be eroded through resistance and reform. But ultimately, this form of social power must be transcended. A robust democratization agenda would address the modalities we have mapped sociologically, replacing each of them with forms of power that enable human flourishing through inclusive collaboration. But that is a topic for another occasion.